we want to ask a very simple but perplexing question. Why do reliable systems fail? Lauren Hochstein asked me that, and it was kind of a great light bulb going off because it's a question that allows us to understand something that has become confounded in the way we look at safety and reliability and risk. So very simply, the answer is reliable systems fail in part because we confound reliability, robustness, and resilience. So we want to explore and understand a little bit of the difference so we can start to understand how reliable systems can still fail and what that means for the kinds of steps we need to take in order to create systems that will meet all three of those R's. They will be reliable, robust, and resilient. So first, reliability. Reliability tends to be based on data from the past, what has happened over time. The service works as intended. It works to meet certain criteria. And the expectation as you try to meet those criteria is that you can meet them better. You can get better statistics. You can get more confidence in your statistics because over a longer period of time, things are working reliably. Uh, but what the data about the past says about the future, right, is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed if things change. And of course, right, that assumption that change is limited or well marked, so you can rely on the past data, but you'll know for sure when things are different. So you can say, I need to collect new data, invest in new directions, et cetera. Uh, but since change is omnipresent and because change is rarely well marked for complex systems, performance in the future depends on other capabilities and factors. The pace of change, the extensiveness of the interdependencies, where and how uh, brittleness shows up in the underlying system, uh, in fact, how it's been built to be robust and how it's built to be resilient, uh, both in terms of actual practice separate from intent. Simply put, a service can be both reliable and brittle. brittle uh, right? Reliable about the past, but brittle with respect to the possibility of performance dropping off quickly when there's a challenge at the boundaries. Uh, nothing about the analysis of past data to build a sense of reliability provides a specification on how to recognize when change invalidates the assumptions about the past, right? And uh, uh, when change invalidates the assumption that the, past, the future will look just like the past. So our reliability depends on this assumption. Future will look just like the past. That's not a safe assumption for complex systems. Now, second is reliability statistics are model dependent. The data track, the actions taken to engineer the system, the kinds of safety interventions, the, under, the understanding of what's a threat to safety and how we counter those threats to safety are a model. They're a model of right, how a system works, the threat, what threatens failure, what blocks failure, what is needed to recover when failure threatens. Time and again, large system failures, real failures, real breakdowns reveal that the model has become wrong. They have been good at one point in time, but now it's no longer an accurate, complete assessment of safety, the threats to safety, how we, how we block threats to safety. The, um, all of those industries had a record of past reliability. You can look at this in particular with the Space Shuttle Challenger and Columbia accidents. In all of these, the over-reliance on past reliability statistics led the key stakeholders to miss or discount evidence that that model embedded in the past reliability data was no longer reflecting the current operations. New indicators, new evidence was occurring that said threats were different, Right. Vulnerabilities are different and the ability to handle those vulnerabilities was not what we actually had counted on. Um, so 
what this leads us to is the idea that we need to be uh, looking ahead at the potential for surprise, not just relying on past statistics that show how reliable we have been. The surprises can occur, those surprises challenge the model underneath those reliability data, right? And that's what helps us check or rebuild robustness and resilience moving forward, moving into the future, right? And that moving into the future is critical for proactive safety. Now, in order to understand the uh, robustness and resilience, we need to think a little bit about that model. And this is an old idea we introduced uh, 35 years ago that a plan, a AI system, uh, automation, autonomous capability has a envelope, right? It has a range over which it works, it, we, a range in which it is competent. It's good, it does, it, it produces performance, it behaves, it works out in a way. If you can follow the plan, if you can deploy that capability, right? If you can uh, utilize that automation, uh, you will understand and get competent performance to some criteria. So that competence envelope exists, but it's an envelope, it has limits, right? Finite resources change and events can challenge the boundaries of that. This is particularly evident these days in major failures, extreme weather events, uh, the uh, Boeing uh, 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 engineering failures that led to two accidents with the 737 MAX and MCAS automation. The, um, uh, in all of these situations, and of course now COVID, the rolling outbreaks of COVID-19 moving across the world, all of these show un unanticipated stress and surprise that come from the limits of our operation of our systems as designed. So the model as deployed will always be mismatched to some degree to the total environment and variations and events that can occur. Right? In fact, this mismatch can only be seen when anomalies and exceptions and surprises arise. Right? If, you are, if you don't have a challenge event, everything's gonna seem like the plan works fine, the automation handles everything. So we get this kind of paradox of super smooth performance inside the confidence envelope but near the boundaries as these anomalies and exceptions arise, we start to be able to see that, wait a minute, things aren't quite the same. We're gonna come back to that. This is a very important thing as we move forward and some of the things we're gonna look at and understand. So people will tend to overestimate the size of the confidence envelope and they'll tend to be overconfident that surprises have been minimized. So, robustness arises by starting to think about those surprises, to pay attention to them, and what, what, what do we do? We modify the system as deployed in order to make it robust in the face of those anomalies, exceptions, and surprises. Now the catch is we have to know exactly what the anomaly and exception and surprise is. It's this specific exception comes up. We hadn't taken it into account, now we can take it into account. So robustness right, complements optimality by saying, I'm not just trying to get optimal on efficiency, you know, faster, better, cheaper. I'm also trying to be robust to well understood forms of challenge, particular kinds of disruptions or variabilities that we can understand, track, model, specify, analyze in detail. That's great. But the surprises have a second status. And this, we like to always say, uh, was evident in the way that mission control worked with space shuttle operations. They practiced a variety of kinds of anomalies occurring and how to deal with them. Now, in some ways, as they practiced anomalies, right, well, to practice one, you have to have an anomaly. So they understand this is a surprise, a challenge that could occur, and they had some basis for thinking they could handle it. But in running these, they would often discover there are a variety of kinds of skills, uh, collaborative skills, individual problem solving skills, uh, coordinating, the flight director coordinating all the different parts for different kinds of anomalies, or many other kinds of skills that are important to practice, even if you understand something about the anomaly you're trying to work through. Uh, so they were practicing these skills 
Why? Because they would apply to cases that they hadn't practiced, right? So I can practice a specific failure on launch and work on the procedures and who I need to talk to and what we need to check and what analysis programs need to be run and who else can help verify or corroborate that we replanned in the proper way. And it's tailored to that specific anomaly. Now, what happens when a different one occurs? Well, practicing that specific anomaly, okay, that adds to robustness, but it adds to resilience because it was practicing those skills and problem solving and coordinating and synchronizing and uh, uh, working through uncertainty, resolving uncertainty, uh, getting different perspectives to integrate. And you can see these in many of the, the uh, studies we did to document how that practice worked, why this was a resilient problem solving group, not just simply a group that added robustness for specific failures that could occur. So now we have three things. We have, uh, looking backward, we can examine our reliability record and say we are happy with that and that's great. And we can make investments uh, to build reliability in terms of specific factors in the, in the system and specific criteria. But knowing about the past doesn't tell us about the future. Right? To, uh, to address the future, we need to think about what happens when the future is different than the past. And for us to be uh, effective and manage risk, we need to be robust and resilient. So our surprise or anomalous events have two statuses. One, as a measure or test of robustness for that specific anomaly that was run or challenge that was run. But also, that challenge allows us to look at the general skills. And at this stage, you understand reliability, looking backward, but that makes the assumption about the future will match the past. But that assumption needs to be checked. So we have to engage in activities to check that assumption, right? And based on that, we can build robustness and resilience into our system. This is, allows us to go back and readdress the question we started with. Why do reliable systems fail? Change happens. New vulnerabilities arise. New connections, new interdependencies, new contexts of use, new external events and threats. Those are changes are inevitable at some pace, at some rate. Eventually, the future will not match the past on some important dimension. Proactive safety says we have mechanisms in place to catch that change. To understand that, is, a, is it different? Where it's different? How threats are new? Right? How mechanisms we had to counter threats are no longer as effective in the past. Because what had worked right, may not work as well as change occurs. Investments in robustness and resilience become requirements to build a proactive safety system. 